Okay. Chest. Chest is freaking done. I am freaking done. With the lift, that is. And now I get to go home, eat some food, have some sweets. Sweets and steaks. I think that's a, well, steak. Singular, not plural. And I should be able to go to sleep. A happy freaking camper. So, I think I know exactly what I gotta talk about here. And I cannot stress this enough that you need to understand, especially in picture and video, your body fat level is going to play a substantial role in not only how you look in general, but also how big you look, right? There could be a guy 40 fucking pounds lighter than me, 50 pounds lighter than me, but if he's diced and we're posing together, like, sure, I may, you know, be a little bit, like, larger in the frame, but his ass is going to look fucking cooler. Because right? he's got fucking cuts and striations and veins all over the place. And even somebody who's, like, legit smaller can kind of hold their own against someone who's bigger than them if they've got more body fat. And, you know, that's just a fact of life, right? Or a fact of, uh, you know, our fucking human perception of shit. But what a lot of people take that as is just okay i can never put on too much body fat because it's going to make me look smaller i i, I don't want to look smaller i don't want to lose my cut side I, I i just want to stay where i am you know if you're floating around like 10 percent ish body fat you know reasonably lean you got veins when you're pumped you can see your abs it's a very comfortable state of being but you gotta remember you know just being comfortable you're not gonna fucking get anywhere right you know, a ship is safe in the harbor, but that's not what it's really fucking meant for, you know? So people who are discouraged by bulking due to the fact that they're like, oh, well, I don't want to lose my abs. I don't want to lose my veins. You know, I don't want to look, like, subjectively worse than I do now. You're looking at the fucking, you know, you're looking at the picture way too close up, man. You got to back up and understand... If your weight is plateaued, and like, I'd say for the beginner lifter, for the most part, <sighs> unless you're like chronically skinny, I mean like fucking bones, or in that case, you really got to start packing on calories ASAP to just get some fucking mass on your body. But for the most part, for the beginner lifter, I'm not going to say jump on an insane bulk. It's just not necessary yet. I'd say main gaining is really probably the name of the game there, you know. Eat your protein, however many pounds you weigh, about two grams, or no, no, what am I talking, two grams, about a gram of protein to match that is about right. So if you're a 180 pound lifter, if you get about 180 grams of protein, I don't think there's any need to go higher than that, but that's about right. <sighs> And that's pretty conventionally agreed upon. People, I mean, some guys are going to say you don't need that much. Other kind of maybe more old school guys are going to say you should do upwards of like two grams per pound of body weight. I'll say this. If you do a gram per pound, you're probably in the green. You're probably good. Uh, you know, so eat your protein. You know, maybe try to get a few extra cups of rice or a few extra helpings at you know, your family's dinner every night. And just lift hard. You can make some solid gains. But if you're plateaued, if you've been lifting hard and you do want to get bigger, but the scale isn't changing and you're just staying the same fucking weight, you got to make a serious move, you know, because you, you're not progressing. You're just maintaining. So if the cost of growing is a little bit of extra body fat on you for you know a period of time, not as freaky pumps, you know, you're not covered in veins or whatever, then fuck it, man, that's what you got to do. You know, don't be discouraged by getting a little bit softer for the fact, uh, or because it's for the sake of growing. And then you'll be able to cut down, and you should have a little bit more muscle mass after the end of that little process. You know, so the guys who are too afraid to bulk up, long-term gains, you know, if I shake a fucking Magic 8 ball, not likely. Right? And same thing with guys who are afraid to cut down. Because 
I'm not going to say you can't just continue gaining weight perpetually, but from my experience, I find it's much easier to bulk for a period of time, usually pretty long, and then do kind of a short, pretty serious dieting phase where I really drop down to a calorie deficit. Like I really do have to track and make sure that I'm under a certain limit so that I can lose body fat progressively over the course of that little, you know, dieting phase. But a reasonably long bulk, but eventually, I mean, the simplest way to put it is I just fucking get tired of food, you know? Like, not because I'm like, oh, I'm not hungry, I'm gonna stop the bulk. But I do reach a point where as the bulk progresses, I'm eating more and more calories to continue gaining weight. And it's not like I could ever... Mm. Oh, goodness. It's not like I could ever eat 10,000 calories per day on a consistent basis. Uh, it's just not fucking maintainable. You know, even upwards of 5,000 to around 6,000, that's as much as I can do on a daily basis for just a short period of time, like only probably a month, two months. And then it's just fucking too much. You know, I can't keep pushing it. Uh, literally to the point where, you know, my body itself, it's like I'm just not fucking hungry at all. So when I ended my last bulk and started dieting down, that first week, I was eating like fucking 1,400 calories. And not because I was trying to like crash diet, but just because I wasn't fucking hungry, you know? My, um, just my appetite, everything, it's like... In a way, your body kind of uh, you know, wants to stay in homeostasis. It wants to stay the same size, the same everything. So in order to change, you've got to give it a stimulus which is intense enough for it to fucking have to adapt. So be it your training, you know, obviously if you train like a fucking baby, that's not going to be intense enough for your body to say, holy shit, i got to fucking grow and prepare to do this again next time. If you just go to the gym like a chump, your biceps are going to be like, Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. Another easy workout. No need to recover. We're good. Or, no, no, no. Of course they're going to recover. But no need to grow. They're good enough. Right? And similarly with food, you know. If I just ate 4,000 calories on a consistent basis, eventually I would reach a size where 4,000 calories was my maintenance. And I wouldn't gain any more weight. No matter how hard I tried. Because every day... Your body burns a certain amount of energy, and in order to stay the same body weight, you have to consume that same amount of energy, right? So, if my body needs 4,000 calories a day to just, you know, maintain the amount of muscle I have and support, you know, my daily activity level, cardio, walking around, doing my normal shit, and a hard lift, then I've got to eat 4,000 just to you know, keep that routine up. And if I want to grow, I got to eat, you know, I like at least a 500 calorie surplus. I'm never too, like, specific with it like that, but I do make sure I'm eating enough food to actually be growing. And then, you know, that 500 extra calories, it's got to go somewhere. And part of it is just you know, nutrient partitioning because you're eating more. You're literally just taking in more mass than you're expelling. So it's got to go somewhere, muscle and body fat primarily. That's really the only fucking way to do it. There is no circumstance whatsoever where I could stay a 250 pounder, a 260 pounder by eating 2,500 calories a day. It's just not fucking feasible. That's too low. That amount of calories per day is gonna make me fucking shrink down to the size at which that's maintenance and that's gonna be fucking lighter, right? So the point I'm trying to say here Apart from the fact that in some instances a bulk and a cut aren't necessary and you shouldn't be a wuss about the fact that if you bulk up, you are going to get a little bit softer and if you cut down, you are going to get a little bit weaker. Right? Just fucking deal with it. But secondary to that, or honestly maybe even more important than that that I'm trying to get across to you is the fact that calories are the number one factor which are gonna determine whether or not you can make changes to your physique in terms of size and body fat percentages. 
you know, body fat, not distribution, but you know, the amount that you have on you. you know, there is no world in which you can fucking lose body fat eating 5,000 calories a day. Unless you're Michael Phelps and you're burning it off because you're swimming in like a fucking really cold pool for hours on end and you're constantly doing cardio. Now, if that's you, that's fucking badass. You're an Olympic athlete. You probably got a bazillion gold medals. But more than likely, that is not you. So you're not going to be able to fucking just chow down and stay lean eating as, as much food as you need. Right? If you want to lose body fat, then there's no secret. There's no trick. Really, the only thing that you need to do is make sure that you're eating less calories than you're burning. So your body has to, you know, say, holy shit, I need more energy. Where am I going to get it from? Well, there's no more food in my system. I already burned that all off. My, uh, my muscles aren't really full of that much glycogen because I'm not really eating that much. I guess I'm going to have to oxidize some fucking body fat so I can, you know, run this shit. Right? Your body, uh, I'm trying to, it's almost like you're a car and you've got two gas tanks. One gas tank, let's call that like your your reserve tank or whatever, right? That's your backup generator. That's the body fat that you have stored up. And then your other gas tank, which you're constantly filling, that's like the food that you're eating every day. So if you kind of stop filling up that gas tank, which you're usually you know, filling up every day, that's, you know, what I'm trying to compare to the food that you're eating, then you're going to have to go off that reserve. And, I mean, I'm not sure why this is so problematic to people. For the most part, lifters get it. We can all wrap our head around the fact that if you want to lose body fat, you have to eat less calories. Adding cardio is going to help that substantially. Um, I know you're probably not going to do that, though. So if you can count your calories and be a big boy and actually track your shit and be honest with yourself... And weigh it on the scale, like, okay, eight ounces of you know, turkey with 30 grams of uh, buffalo sauce. Okay, I gotta look, I gotta read the nutrition label on the back of the sauce and count how many calories of, uh, or how many grams of fat I just ate. That's really the only fucking way to go about it. Now, when you do diets, or if like you have a bodybuilding coach and he gives you like a dieting plan, sure, you are following what he's telling you, you know. Two cups of rice in the morning with your eight ounces of ground chicken. But the special part isn't that you're eating rice and chicken or whatever. It's that throughout the entire day, the food that he's giving you to try and bring your body fat level down is only enough to put you in a calorie deficit. Or at the very least, maintenance. Because let's say you're already getting pretty lean and you don't want to over diet for, let's say you're doing a bodybuilding show. I, I think it's very strange that this is even a topic that requires discussion. And I know I'm not like, I don't put myself in the best position to give dieting advice because I'm fucking eating like treats and shit all the time. But, you know, if you're doing stuff that lets you get to this size, you do end up having a much higher metabolism. So you can't get away with fucking eating a ton of sweet treats and whatever else. But even though I'm doing that, You've got to understand, this is all calories in, calories out. I'm not attesting to the fucking, you know, health effects of eating six donuts uh, for breakfast every so often. But I will say, if I can eat in a day seven, eight hundred grams of carbs, 150 grams of fat, and my 250 grams of protein, when I couple that with my training and cardio and everything else, I know that I'm going to grow. And once this bulk is over, I'm like, okay... It's time to trim down. I want to put myself in a situation where I'm losing body fat. Then I'm still going to eat my, you know, 250 grams of protein or so. Around maybe 75, 80 grams of fat. And I'm going to cut my carbs all the way down to fucking you know, maybe 200, 250 grams per day or something. And no matter what sources all that shit is from, whether it's fucking, you know, spicy chicken sandwiches or uh, cereal or whatever. As long as at the end of the day, I hit those macros, I am going to be able to stay in a calorie deficit and burn body fat and get leaner. You know? 
Now, in a dining phase, I am much more prone to eating much what you'd kind of consider like healthier, normal foods because they're more filling for the amount of uh, calories that are in them. If I eat a bowl of ice cream and I'm trying to diet down, I can eat about 800 calories and I'd probably be hungry in like an hour because it's not very filling. So when I diet down, I do eat foods that are much more, you know, or much less calorie dense. You know, I'm talking keto bread. I'm talking a lot of egg white omelets with just hot sauce and a lot of like, you know, chopped spinach and shit. Stuff where I can be full, but not have a ton of calories. So take with that what you will. You know, if you see, uh, typically it's body positive characters. Uh, they do not love the idea of calories in, calories out. And, I mean, they are wrong, 100% fucking wrong. But I can understand why they wouldn't really want to you know, kind of follow that logic. Because it's, I mean, it kind of makes food a little bit of a chore. You know, like before I was bodybuilding, as serious as I am now, and I was just like a fucking kid in high school, you know, I was eating just, like, just fucking stupid shit, like whatever. Oh, I'm hungry for this? Okay, I eat it, whatever. Like, that's sort of, my, that was my approach. And once you get into calorie tracking and like you're tracking your macros and like you're, you know, how much protein is in and everything, people kind of have this misconception that that's going to, ruin their perception of food and they're like oh I don't want to look at food like it's numbers uh, I want to just be able to enjoy it you know I don't want to feel bad for eating uh, you know this or so but if your goal is to actually change the way you look and you fucking build you know and turn it into something that you want to then that's just part of the deal you got to accept it and really I only see the fucking benefits you know Nobody starts tracking their macros and then says, wow, I hate that I have to do this. Actually, well, I feel like they say that in a kind of joking way. But, I don't know, for me, I always kind of, like, whenever I eat something, I always know how many calories I'm eating. Within a pretty reasonable range of estimation. Just because I look at a, you know, you give me, I order a fucking burger at a restaurant. Oh, that's 40 grams of carbs worth of bun. No, it's kind of, I can tell this is sort of a fatter cut of a, a beef. I'm probably getting like 20, 30 grams of fat, including the mayonnaise or whatever. And then, eh, that's probably about 40 grams of protein worth, worth of patty. Like that sort of thing. But, fuck man, that's just part of the game, you know? <clears throat> Nobody wants to gain a freaky amount of muscle and look nuts. Because <laughs> they want to do everything that a fucking normal average Joe is doing so I say once you start tracking your macros you're not gonna want to look back tomorrow more oh this is gonna be a packed Friday through Sunday so tomorrow morning headed to um, which I guess I feel weird talking about when I'm gonna do shit because in the video it's gonna be delayed but uh, tomorrow we're headed to lift at uh, American Barbell, bright and early, way earlier than I usually would. But after uh, after a full day at the Arnold, I'm going to be freaking, or not just me, I'm sure we're all going to be freaking dead. So training beforehand is probably going to be the best bet. So I'm going to make sure to be nice and full of food tonight so that I can wake up relatively full of carbs. Usually the last thing I want to do is train really early, um, like sort of first thing in the morning, uh, but I'm not saying it's terrible. Honestly, if I was totally strapped and I had to train right in the morning, just because that's what my schedule was, you can make it work. It's not going to be that bad. But usually I would say I prefer training more noon to evening-ish, because by then I will have fucking just eaten a ton of food. Just kind of feel fuller, stronger, more energized. That's going to be a solid back day. So, in the next, I would assume the next few days, that'll be on, I think, the hostile YouTube channel. Uh, whatever lifts we end up doing. And hopefully, we actually get to see some other characters. You got to remember, <laughs> all the lifters who are, you know, flying in from all over the country 
it's like all over the world, you know, coming to the Arnold, they got to train somewhere. And if they're going to the expo during the day, they're probably looking for some badass gyms in the morning and at night. So I'm sure the pros gym actually in Columbus, any time before probably seven o'clock and any time after probably five o'clock, uh, I'm pretty sure it's going to be like packed to the gills. So I'm kind of outsourcing a little bit, driving a little bit further out of the way. But yeah, that'll be fucking fun. So I just got to make sure to pack up all my food and bring a few changes of clothes because we're going straight from the gym to the hostile booth. I guess, I mean, I think by the time this video gets posted, it will be after the fact. But 545, you can't miss it. It's going to be fucking huge. You know, there's kind of an array of, like, booth sizes. The hostile one is pretty fucking big, so I think that'll be fun. I can't wait to see all the fucking new characters, too. Like, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's like surreal. Seeing somebody who you've only ever seen on your phone in person. And then they're also bigger in person, too. It's just fucking fun. So, I'm excited for that. Until then, I gotta focus on getting home and chowing down. In terms of the post-workout meal, I have no earthly idea what it's gonna be. But I'm sure it's gonna be full of carbs. Uh, maybe some... Maybe a steak. I don't know. I'll think about it. I will freaking think about it. But not sure exactly, but I'm pretty certain I'm gonna wake up tomorrow morning at like 261. So nice and heavy for the fucking expo. Not 300, not 310 like some other characters, but 260. So that's a reasonably substantial amount of mass. That's what, a little more than an eighth of a ton? Or just about an eighth of a ton? I can stand behind that for sure. For freaking sure. But yeah. In terms of the length of the bulk, I say this all the time, but I'll just say it again. To be determined, you know? If I'm, you know, floating around like 264 in a month, then I'm going to keep going. And if in two months I'm floating around like 267, I'm going to keep going. If three months I'm floating around 270, I'm going to keep fucking going, you know, because I'm still gaining weight. And as long as I'm not putting on too much fat, I'm going to keep fucking packing on size. Now, if in, you know, one month I'm like 263 and then, you know, eating as much food as I can, you know, realistically get down in another month, I'm still 263 and I can't, I'm not really gaining any more weight. Then something like that is going to kind of be my cue to say, all right, I think this bulk is over. I think this bulk is just about done. Uh, because you know, the whole point is to be growing. Now, I do think there is some benefit in sort of staying bulked for a little bit. Because you got to remember, when you start eating a freaking ton of food compared to just you know, a scrappy amount, like whatever you eat on a you know maintaining sort of calorie intake or a deficit, then... You're gonna, your weight is going to spike. But that spike is not all muscle. Not even close. Right? It's really a ton of water instantly. Water and carbs. Followed by some fat and some muscle. So if in two months you jump your weight up by 30 pounds. And then you say, holy crap, I gained 30 pounds. I'm going to start dieting down. <laughs> You'll probably diet down to maybe, I mean, I'm not, I can't say for sure. But not much heavier than you were at the start. So even if my weight does plateau at like 260 something, I'm still going to hold that weight for a little bit uh, just to, in a sense, sort of get used to it. And then I'll be able to say, all right, I think it's time to trim down, drop the calories to maintenance to deficit, just right around there. And then you know, as many months pass as I need to get back down to a pretty lean body mass and say, all right, I'm hungry again. I want to start bulking then I'll keep going. So it's not necessarily like a, you know, I'm going to do this for X amount of weeks and then I'll do this for X amount of weeks. Like it's not like a pre-programmed thing. It's, um, it's sort of just going based on the results that I you know, can see, right? If you're making gains, I say, why stop? And if you're not making gains, maybe change something. You know? I'm sure I could just, like the answer is clear. 
if I want to keep gaining weight, I'll just eat, just eat more food. Simple. And for the most part, that is usually what I say. But after like a six month bulking period and I really just like the difficulty of getting in that amount of calories as time progresses on the bulk, for one thing, I am eating more over time because I want to gradually be eating more and more calories to keep gaining weight. Uh, it gets progressively more difficult and I can't just keep eating calories until I'm eating like 7,000 a day or even 6,000 a day. That's really pushing it for me. I can't get that down after a few months. So I'll get to a point where I'm like, I just can't eat anymore. It's been six months. It's been X amount of months. Let's cut down and start again. But there's always a progression because this is how a successful bulking and cutting loop should look. If you do it multiple and multiple times, it should be, here's your baseline weight. And then you go, here's, let's say you're 200 pounds here. You bulk up to 230. You cut down, you're as lean as you were in the beginning, but now you're 210. That's a 10 pound gain. You're above where you started. You do it again, bulk up to 240, cut down to 220. Another 10 pounds. Now that's not necessarily like a consistent poundage per bulk or whatever. I'm just saying every bulk is heavier than last time and every cut is also heavier than last time. Right? So over time, the idea is bulk up, cut down, bulk up, cut down bulk up, cut down. But if you look at the trend, it's consistently positive. So that's sort of what I've been rocking with as of late. And this bulk seems to be going rather well. Because in my last few, like, I don't remember exactly how my sort of weight has gone on all my bulks. Because I started really bulking up and cutting down at like 200-ish. 200 was like my peak weight before. And now, I think the first one I got to like 230, and then I cut down to like 210. And then I was up in like the 240 range, then down to like 27, I don't remember, 220 maybe. And it just kind of kept going up and up and up. And then now, bulked up, floating around the, um, at the end of it, I can foresee the high 260 range, just based on the trend that's been going on for now, and how it sort of looks like it's going to keep progressing. So... Me lean, I'm not exactly sure what my weight's gonna be, but after this bulking phase, when I get down to like the two low 230s to 230, that should be a pretty freaky look. Should be a pretty freaky look. And that makes me excited. I get excited to think about how I'm gonna look when I'm diced. You know, when I, uh, I haven't really been posted on the Instagram because I'm more prone to you know, post it just a still photo when I'm lean because it's just cooler and more impressive. Uh, but when I look at those leaner pictures on the Insta, and I'm doing like a side tricep with a shoulder pump, and I can see my striations. There's just veins everywhere. Or I'm doing like a like a bicep shot, like my abs are out. That's fucking badass. And I get excited to cut down, because I know that's what's at the end of it. But in the same sense, you can't just jump the gun and you know get straight to that final destination. There's a journey that you have to go through to get there, and that's gaining size. So um, I think it's been, it's gotten a little bit better. We're not, um, I feel, and this is just sort of my, like, my observation of, like, Instagram shorts and, like, TikTok posts about fitness, so probably not the best source of information. But I felt like for a while there, last year and earlier, People were really focused on fucking getting lean. Like, I'd see a lot of, um, like, fitness sort of, what's the, what's the word I'm thinking of? Kind of like news, not news, but like fitness videos where guys are, like, talking about drama or whatever. And a lot of them are talking about, like, how it was kind of a, not a trend, but it was kind of happening a lot. People were just jumping straight to, like, starvation diets they were just trying to get super lean before even really bulking up or building up a baseline physique. As of late, I think that's, you know, people have gotten better at that. We're kind of understanding you got to put some mass on and then show it off in a cutting phase later, which I think it's very good. It's a much better approach than just fucking you know, trying to dice down with nothing to show for it. Um, what was I going to say? But yeah, so part of that also is you kind of have to have a little bit of a 
disconnect from your current state of being and be able to look at your situation almost from the third person as if you're an outside observer and be able to understand like, okay, sure, I am going to be a bit fatter. Um, I am going to have some more body fat. I am not going to be as lean when I'm bulking up. It is going to be a little bit uncomfortable to eat that much food. But that's just this one step, you know, and there's also benefits when you're bulking up. You're nice and fucking strong. Your pumps are insane. You're lifting some serious weight. You feel pretty good when you're fucking training because you're really pushing yourself. All those are pretty big positives in my eyes. And just walking around heavy, it's just fun. You know, it's just fun to really fill out your shirts and, you know, everything else. Like, being big in baggy clothes, that's just cool. And then, you know, once you've kind of gone through that phase, you get to enjoy the second part, which is when you're dieting down, you've got some shit to show for it, you know? If you're a total beginner and you jump straight to a serious dieting phase, you got to remember, like, maybe a little bit of newbie gains can be built in a calorie deficit. If you're a total beginner to the gym, you haven't lifted before, and you start, you know, lifting hard in a deficit, you will gain muscle, um, just because of the fact that you're not, you're so underexposed to weight training, you're just physically going to get a little beefier from the activation of all your whatevers, but you're not in a good state to build muscle if you're in a deficit. So to jump straight into a, you know, steep deficit, really dropping pounds right as a beginner, you know, aiming for just a, you know, as much leanness as you can muster. I just wouldn't say that's the best approach. You know, I think you'd be better off maybe main gaining, building a little bit more of a baseline first. And then once you have that, you can be in a better position to actually cut down and see some shit underneath. Now, that's a little bit of a recommendation, I'd say, more towards the kind of moderate body fat beginner. If um, if you've got to start your lifting journey as a fat loss journey, then that is a little bit different. You may be better off in a relatively solid deficit right in the beginning, just because you know if you have a lot of excess body fat as a beginner, that is something which you're going to be better off peeling off first. But you got to kind of be able to look at it from your own uh, situation and decide what's best for you. And I'm not a fitness coach, right? and I haven't lived that sort of experience. So if that's you, you'd probably be better off you know, finding like a, a guy posting fitness stuff who did start off with a lot of body fat and you know worked his way through it. Because he's going to be able to relate to your situation way fucking more. I was more of a... I, I, I started as like a 160-pound like lean kid so I didn't have to deal with um, you know, trim it down first I got to jump straight to eating turkey sandwiches with like half the packet of turkey and then just trying to lift as hard as I could I think that's all I got big weekend ahead if you take pictures make sure to post them and tag me I love seeing those I, uh, I always scroll through I kind of scroll through everything. I scroll through the comments a lot, just you know, seeing what people, seeing what you guys are saying. But I like scrolling through the um, the Instagram too, and the the tagged photos. Anytime I'm ever somewhere where there's a lot of people and we're taking pictures, I do like looking back at them. And you know, I'm beginning to think that I th may benefit from chilling on back. Uh, just because in comparison with everything else on my build, my back's pretty good. I'd say when it comes to my strong points, uh, it probably goes shoulders number one and back number two. Everything else is kind of balanced. And then my weakest point, triceps. So I, th I mean, you got to remember, uh, if you know anything about the way of the giant pumpkin, this is a, this is a, I don't know if Devin Larratt developed this theory. Of, I feel like it's been done before. But the premise is, if you're trying to grow a giant pumpkin, then you, know, you start off with whatever vine, and you see which one becomes the biggest, and you pick the one that has the most promise, and you cut all the other fucking pumpkins off. 
So all of the nutrients from this pumpkin vine are just being sent to this one fucking pumpkin so that it's got more energy at its disposal to grow and get big, you know? So following that logic, um, well, the logic there, which explained by Devin Larratt, arm wrestler extraordinaire, is, you know, he's got his money arm, which in arm wrestling means that's the arm he's really competing with, that he's got the most skill and just genetic whatever. It's just his stronger arm, his dominant arm. So arm wrestlers, what they'll do is they've got their money arm and their other arm. And they're, the one that they put all their focus into and most of their training into is substantially larger than the other one. So just by looking at that, that's legitimate, just tangible proof that by backing off, well, okay, maybe not exactly. Of course, whatever you train is going to develop more than something that you don't train. But you could sort of, I mean, I feel like you can understand the fact that if you're not training your left arm, then you're going to have more energy to recover the right one. Now, I would never go so far as to train one side of my body and not the other one. That's just not the point of, uh, you know, hypertrophy. I need that, uh, I need that symmetrical look. But for me, you know, if I look at everything, since back and shoulders are kind of a strong point for me, it would make sense that if I eased up on the intensity or even just the frequency of their training, then the energy that I'm, you know, the energy and nutrients that are getting sent to my back and my shoulders whenever I train them could be better used on my chest and my arms and my legs. So I've gone through periods of time where I skipped back. Um, I've gone, I'm not sure how long, maybe six months I've gone through periods of time where I did not train back, at least four months, uh, because it was a strong point. I wanted the rest of my build to catch up. So I think I'm at the point now where I've seen, or I see enough of my like poses and stuff where I can tell back. I know this is insane coming out of my mouth, but I think it's big enough relative to the rest of me. You know, so I think I'm going to be better off putting more of my recoverability points, if you will, into my arms and my chest and my legs. So I think I'm going to start chilling out on back. This may, uh, <clears throat> my car is making a really fucking weird noise. It's probably just my a belt or something, but, uh, yeah, so I think. I should chill out on back. So that's going to make my training split a little bit... Um, hmm, I'll have to think about it. Because, yeah, I do think I need. I should probably relax on back a little bit. Big enough. To the point where I may only need to hit it once every two weeks or something. So if I take back out of the equation of my, my split, you know, I've got legs, chest, back, and then arms... If this back day disappears, now I've got a blank day. And hell, maybe that would just be better off as a rest day to recover. So, <laughs> oh, oh my god. Uh, so I'll see. But yeah, I think I'm going to relax on my back training, similarly to how I've been doing it with my shoulder training. Or, eh, well, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to skip back entirely. Because I don't want to lose my like my back's strength or anything. But maybe, fuck. I mean, I'd feel kind of silly coming in and just doing like two working sets. But if all I'm trying to do is maintain my back's size and strength, you've got to remember muscle maintenance is much easier and requires much less volume than muscle growth does. You know? So I'm going to have to think about this. I may be... Uh, when it comes to working out your split like this, like if you have a few extra strong body parts that you want to kind of maybe back off the intensity of your training on, it does help to kind of write out your split on paper and like really look at it instead of just trying to think it over in your mind. Because, uh, I mean, I think we all understand that. It's easier to think your thoughts out and really kind of analyze them if you write it down. But yeah, I think back's got to chill. Back has got to freaking chill. Uh, and then especially because I was doing... um. When I see the pose down, I'm pretty sure we were pumpless, or I was pumpless at least, 
I may have to look at more of those pictures. When I was training with uh, with Nick Justice and Jacob Robichow, I may be saying that wrong, but you know he's a fucking professional. Jacob is. He's a pro bodybuilder. Uh, and when it comes to most first shots, he's ahead on the arm game, primarily in chest. I'd say those are the two things where he really jumps out above me. Uh, but when we do a back lat spread, size-wise, not too incomparable. Of course, he's dieting down and I'm bulking up, so that does make it a little bit tricky to compare people's builds. But yeah, I think back is my back training is going to become a bit more sparse. So uh, I don't know, man. Maybe instead of a, instead of a dedicated arm day. I might split up arms into two days because I don't, for me, my limiting factor in terms of my training frequency is pretty much legs, right? I used to do legs, chest and back, and then arms, and then repeat, but I can tell my leg training is better when I have three days in between hitting legs instead of two. So I don't want to like completely suck a day out of the loop and then train legs every three days. It's just not, um, for me personally, it just doesn't end up working out. I'm not fully recovered by the time I get back and I can tell it's kind of hindering my lift. So maybe I'll just do a fucking bicep day and a, and a tricep day on their own because I do want my arms to catch up too. They're, uh, I'd say arms are definitely something which I do want to build up. So maybe giving them each an individual day, yeah, that's probably good for me. So do not be surprised if the split for the next few months, or, well, a few weeks at least, I gotta try it out, ends up being just fucking legs. Oh, actually, you know what? Mm. I, I'll, I wanna even it out. I want the workouts to be very balanced in terms of their volume. But yeah, I think for the next few weeks, I'm gonna take back out, maybe just do a little bit for like maintenance maintenance purposes like just do like two sets of pull downs every so often and two sets of like rows every so often uh, but yeah I think if I do end up sticking with that sort of idea then that's going to mean that the only muscle groups I'm going to be hitting in my split are going to be hamstrings and quads chest biceps and triceps so five I could consolidate maybe I might end up doing the biceps with hamstrings just based on this little combination because then I can have a whole day for quads, which quads is a very taxing lift for me. So if I can cut hamstrings out and then just have a day dedicated to quads, I think it'll be better because I won't be, you know, literally pre-exhausted from training hamstrings before. And then a whole day dedicated to triceps, I want my triceps to come up. So fuck. I think the lift from here on out for at least a few weeks, well, at least a week, you know, I've made changes to my workout split before, and then I went back to what I like. Uh, but I think it's going to look something like this. Uh, let me let me try to fucking imagine this here. Probably, I want to separate chest and triceps by a day because they're both going to get kind of activated, so I don't want them to be playing into each other. Yeah, I think something like this. Quads, chest, biceps and hamstrings, triceps. I think that's what I gotta do for a little bit. And not because I think that's an awesome split and that's what everybody should be doing. Do not even think about taking like that. I mean, you just, that my whole thought process just developed in the car so that was my whole you know sometimes when shit gets clipped it kind of takes out the explanation but yeah I think those are the weak points that I want to bring up so taking the gas off of my strong points would just make sense so I know that all the because you gotta remember people watching these videos not everyone is watching every single one in its entirety which I can understand. There's a fucking million of them. Uh, so I'm not going to be surprised when all the comments are like, why is he only doing triceps today? Why is he only doing, like, where's back? Where's the back training? So if uh, if you would like, if you'd like to be a good Samaritan, 
if you ever see comments like that, maybe just say he's working on his weak points. You know, something like that. But yeah, I I don't know why I haven't been thinking this sooner. Because I do, like relative to my back, my chest needs work. And relative to everything else, my arms also need work. And then everybody needs bigger legs. I think that's going to be the split. So that'll be good, you know? That'll be, uh... But it's not like I watched a video of some other bodybuilder do this exact, like, move. And I'm like, okay, he did it, so it's going to work for me. I mean, you just heard me fucking explain it. Did it make some logical sense? I think it fucking did, you know? Half the shit... Sure, you could copy what other people do, and, like, it might work. But at the origin of all this, like, conventional moves bodybuilding wise in terms of like frequency <clears throat> frequency and sets and like rep schemes and styles and movements and stuff it was all just originated by think by people using their brain right putting a little effort in the, with their noggin and thinking okay this makes sense <clears throat> and then translating a theory like just a thought in their head to trying it out for a few months if it works it works sick if it doesn't work and eh, screw it go back to what works so <coughs> if i could leave if i could somehow imprint uh one idea into every lifter's mind it would be to put a large emphasis on trial and error in terms of like their training their diet their everything like there's so many there's a million fucking buzzwords when it comes to working out, like too many to even keep track of, you know, and everybody has different opinions and different ideas. So what's going to make you like one guy's ideas versus the other? Half of it is just going to be the likability of the dude, you know, like if you like somebody and maybe you like the way they look, you're probably going to be more inclined to listen to what they have to say. And sometimes that might be the wrong fucking move, you know, because it may not fucking translate to your own gains. So that's why I really want to stress the importance of trying this shit out for yourself and then seeing what happens. You know, you're never going to train so wrong that you're going to fucking croak, right? And if you've been kind of plateaued and your gains have been pretty static, you know, you can tell looking at you now versus a year ago, there's not much difference. And, you know, even in like size, strength, or just your current body weight, the amount of muscle you have in your frame. If you're not that much different and you've been doing the same routine for fucking, you know, 12 months on end, what do you have to lose, man? Because clearly what you've been doing is only enough to maintain where you're at. So, I mean, we all know the definition of insanity. If you're repeating the same shit and expecting it to suddenly just start working for you, you're, uh, I tell you what, you're not going to get anywhere fast for sure. And the last thing we want to do is just toil away, you know? Like, if I had zero gains over the last year, something is fucking wrong with me. And I got to find out what that is as soon as possible so I can, you know, move the scale, up the ticker, you know, make some, make some fucking muscle, you know? So don't be afraid to uh, try things which may be considered conventionally unconventional. Because you think it might end up working for you. And then there's only two results that can happen. And both of them are positive. Either you, you know, gain gains, right? It ended up being a successful experiment. You made some fucking, you know, you deposited some mass under your frame. Or you learned, okay, this did not work. Let me try something else, right? We, it's, uh, and that's a great way to look at shit. You either succeed or you learn. Are any of those situations negative? No. Come on, man. And uh, I know it's a little bit tricky to do that. Because if you've done a workout split for like a year, or you've been working out in the same way for like a year on end, and you made gains in the beginning, then you literally have proof in your mind like, oh, this worked a few months ago. Why isn't it working now? You know, like I've been reluctant to change my workout style. Uh, as years have gone on, but look, man, I do not regret it. 
because I know that the more changes I make over time and I try to improve my training in terms of like its stimulation or its trajectory or whatever, the amount of volume and frequency, for the most part, every change that I've made, and I've made some which were stupid, and I learned that, like when I was doing the two-a-day stuff, like that was fucking dumb, but every time I either made more gains and I continue to progress in a way which I think is, you know, increasing in its efficacy if we want to get all fancy pants you know, smart word kind of termsy but right, either it, it my training got better or i learned how not to do it and then moved on you know so can't stress it enough do not get too locked into any idea when it comes to your training but on the opposite side of that coin you can't just fucking try all sorts of shit every week because that's just not long enough to really see if it works, you know? Like, that's like laying out in the sun because you want to tan, and then the first day you lay out, nothing happens. And you're like, this didn't freaking work at all. Oh, this doesn't work, I can't get tan. Like, that's kind of a weird example, but, like, one workout doesn't do much. You know, Going to the gym one time, you will never notice a difference the next day. And I'm not talking, like, of course, you could feel sore, you could feel tired. But I'm talking about, like, your size. You're not just going to grow after one workout. This takes a while. So, you know, pick a certain style or have your buddy show you a workout or whatever. Or even if you've just been training for a while and you feel pretty experienced. But you can tell your training has been very, like, kind of lackadaisical. You just sort of go in and do whatever you want and then move on. You know, you do need to do kind of a specific routine for, I don't know, two, three months. And then you can kind of gauge, okay, I'm making gains. Or, all right, I'm not making any fucking gains. I need to change something in this routine. And as much information and, like, debates that happen about training style as there are, it makes people think, like, okay, I have to change, I have to change my training. My training is clearly the issue. I have to change. I have to completely uproot my training style and start training like this guy. Oh, wait, this guy's wrong. I better start training like this. It's not always about the training either. You got to remember, there's pretty much three pillars which should be in equilibrium to accommodate gains. And, of course, number one is training. You're not going to fucking grow muscle without stimulating it. Number two is your diet. You're not going to be able to fucking grow muscle if you don't have enough fucking energy and, uh, I mean, just physical matter and proteins or whatever else in your system to be able to build that muscle. It doesn't just come out of thin air. And then your sleep. So if both of these two things are on point, you're training pretty hard and smart and you're eating enough food, but your sleep is total shit and you only get like three or four hours a night, I wouldn't expect some serious progress because you're just going to be fucking hindered, man. You're going to feel like shit when you train. You're going to be fatigued. You're not going to be recovered. You're just going to be toiling away, you know? So you want each of those things to be in equilibrium, right? I'm talking avatar state. All your chakras are flowing. You train hard as fuck. You're full of food. And you get a good night's rest. Uh, you want to be hydrated too, but let's just count that in the food category. Right? When those three things are in fucking in sync, of course I would never say limitless. There's fucking limits upon gains. We are all aware of that. But I see no reason why if those three things are in sync for real, and like you don't just think that they are, they actually are, then you will continue to make progress in the long term. Tip, potentially quotable. If you want to stand out, first you're going to have to stick out. you got to be able to deal with that, you know? So this is primarily directed towards the beginner lifter where you're still kind of making this transition into a fucking I mean a pretty serious commitment if you are locked into making some you know, serious gains and what I mean by that is there are I don't want to say haters <laughs> I think the word I mean I mean this in the opposite way of enablers but there are disablers which you're going to run into into your uh, transition 
to getting into fitness, right? There are going to be dudes where if you bring a fucking, you know, Tupperware bodybuilder style into your school lunch, I guess this, I'm kind of maybe directing this at like high schoolers because I feel like the majority of people who start lifting are probably in high school, at least the people watching this, but this could apply to anybody. Let's say you bring it to work too. You know, I'll hear stories about my mom where like she used to work in a, like an office with this one bodybuilder dude and he'd always whip out some fucking canned tuna and everybody back to you that fucking stinks. In a case like that, maybe just switch to chicken or something that doesn't smell so bad, be a little more courteous. But like I was saying, you know, kind of high school lunchroom, I mean, fuck man, I was busting out boiled eggs when I was dieting down. Because even though I was kind of main gaining in high school, I would still sort of, you know, I would cut every so often. I would get lean every so often and then go back to main gaining or lean bulking, as it were. But there were definitely times where, you know, I've got my sort of high school friend group where it's like me and everybody else, my brother too. So they'd show up at the house sometimes, pick my brother up and you know, go off to do whatever shenanigans. And I'm like, fuck, man, I'm staying home. I got to eat. Or, you know, I, I don't want to stay up too late because I got to wake up early to do my cardio. Um, I'm a little bit lazy with my sleep schedule now because with college classes you don't really have to wake up at a perfect time every day I probably should work on that but you know there's definitely times where you gotta kinda say no because you're doing something for you because you want to do it and it's gonna get you results right? so fuck. everybody in my house looked at me like I was crazy when I was drinking egg whites and you know eating sardines in the fucking kitchen uh, they probably thought I was especially crazy because that was when I was only a 160 pound beginner. So I'm doing all this crazy stuff, food wise, like gym wise, and I didn't even have the results yet to back it up. You know? If you saw me chug a, you know, a mason jar full of egg whites, eat some sardines, and uh, you know, drink a gallon of Crystal Light now as a 260 pound dude, even in fucking public, you know, even if somebody didn't know like who I was, and they just saw a big dude eating very strangely, they're just going to recognize the fact that that is to do with you know, the results that I've got. So you almost get a pass. You know, it's like the bigger you are, the more of a pass you get for doing you know, kind of classic lifter shit. Right? You're not a poser. So as a beginner, you, know, you might hear people say like, oh, why the fuck are you eating that, dude? Come on, that's fucking stupid. Uh, or, you know, if, if you're, uh, if you have potentially less than desirable friends and you, you know, you want to say no to uh, like a hangout or like a trip or whatever else, because, you know, you want to lift, then fuck man, they might rip on you. They might rip on you a little bit. And that's where you got to say, eh, fuck off, man. I'm getting huge. Hit it anyway. You know? So the more of a, uh, shield you can put up on your fucking brain and just you know deflect any potentially demotivating comments or fucking opinions especially as a beginner the better right honestly as a beginner that's the most important fucking part you know, nobody is ever going to give me flack for eating a weird ass fucking bodybuilding meal and carrying around a gallon jug of water because Fuck, man. When you're big, people get the gist. But you know, as a beginner, if somebody's like, oh, why are, you, why are you drinking so much water? Or just... Uh, this is... I'm kind of just saying hypotheticals, too. This isn't necessarily, like, things that I've really heard that much. But, you know... If you can get the mindset of just saying, eh, fuck off. And really meaning it when people say some shit that's fucking... Just like, ugh, I mean, just straight up negative. Anything negative. If you can not let that get under your skin and just keep going how you're going, you're going to set yourself up for success. You know, the chump lifter, or really the chump in general, in any aspect of life, who can hear you know, negative shit or like just fucking let people get under their skin and piss them off. And like, you know, like if somebody t was mean to them early in the day and they have a completely bad day because of it, because you like you care about what somebody thinks and look, not cool, right? Not freaking cool. Now, 
the interstitial state between chump and baller is somebody who, you know, they they maybe get a little bit upset, but they don't let it bother them too much. You know, it's like, oh, they're being mean. Screw them. Um, go about your business. Whereas the enlightened, I, I'd say the enlightened lifter, but I really just mean the enlightened person. Whenever he hears some shit that may be potentially targeted at him, <laughs> if he just doesn't even doesn't even react, not even mentally, like just fucking nothing. And then here's something cool and motivating. He goes, oh shit, I like that. That's what he kind of puts his energy into. He's gonna have a better time. And of course, this goes for everything, but I'm gonna relate it to lifting. And uh, I mean, fuck me. Let's be real. If you post a video of yourself posing. It doesn't matter how big or small you are, you're gonna get comments like, oh, what the fuck? just fucking random ass hate comments, whatever. It's part of the deal. Right? We've all seen, uh, we've all seen David Goggins, right? We all get the gist there. But one, uh, one key aspect, one key like shift in your mentality and your thought process, which will definitely get you going, is to be able to convert anything negative into a fucking positive. Right? And I don't mean that in like a in like a hope pilled like like be nice kind of way. Right? I mean that like if somebody's fucking with you or something or somebody's making you mad or it's I can't really think of an exact scenario right now. I've said this speech before and I've had actual examples. I can't really remember them. But you know, fuck. Anything that you can take in your mind which could maybe potentially demotivate you, right? flip it around and turn it into something cool, right? Somebody, I don't know, somebody makes fun of you for being weak on a certain lift. Don't say, this is the situation you should not have in your head. Oh man, he's right. I'm, my bench is weak. And cry to yourself. Not cool. Now, you flip that around, you say, ah, just wait, you mother effort just wait till I double my bench in the next few years just wait you know what I'm saying I can't really fuck, I don't know I've said this I, I've said this exact speech before like many months ago or maybe even like a year ago or so and I had a lot more actual examples I don't know man you guys fucking spoil me all the comments are like good lift man we love seeing it um, I feel a little, and like, I love it, that's fucking sweet, but honestly, part of me kind of misses getting more hate comments, because it kind of fires me up, you know, as, as, cra as, you know, stupid as that sounds. Yeah, so, whenever you see me do a set that's maybe a little bit too easy, or you can tell I left some shit in the tank, I need you to fucking comment below, say some shit like, uh, that was a fucking pussy set of leg press, you didn't even throw up. Honestly, hearing that kind of shit kind of fires me up, you know. Like, the more you can kind of get excited and motivated by even negative shit like that, okay, and you set yourself up for success. So I think that's the end of my little shtick there. Whether you get it or not, whatever. But solid leg day. That pendulum leg press was fucking cool. That was really fucking cool. I need to do that more often. I like that one. You know what? I, I think I should have done that single leg. I think if I would have done that set single leg, I probably would have had a better time. Because I noticed this on leg extensions and some leg pressing movements. Is if I do both legs at once, I mean, both your quads firing at the same time, that is just sucking oxygen out of your lungs. And I feel like it makes me out of breath a little bit faster. Whereas if I were to do one leg at a time, it wouldn't be so taxing on my whole system because the set is spread out over a longer period, you know, because I'm doing one side, breathing for a few seconds, and then doing the other side, rather than both at once. And also, I think it might help me focus on each quad individually a little bit more. But maybe I'm just saying that because the sets were hard. <laughs> I was out of breath. You know? but yeah, I, I really like that one. And even though it was a leg press, I wasn't really getting too much glutes activation, which that's freaking sweet. Like I was saying on the way here, if, uh, if a leg press really fires my glutes, 
to the point where I feel it more there in my butt than I do in my quads, then that's a little bit of an indicator, uh, indicator, a little bit of an indicator to me to say, I don't like it. I don't much like that. I'm going to do some Smith Machine squats or barbell squats or leg extensions. But that one was pretty cool. That one was pretty cool. I feel kind of bad. I've always had such a closed mind about that machine. I've never used it before now, and I've been going to this gym for years. But not good. The last thing you want to do is limit yourself in terms of your fucking exercise selection. Just for the insignificant thought process of like, oh, that machine doesn't look that good. I'm not going to use it. Stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I feel bad for being there. For having such a narrow mind. As a lifter, it will always do you good to widen your horizons. You know, like I was saying to the pose down, like listening to people talk about training. And this is one thing that's kind of cool about, well, I was going to say about lifting, but it's really cool for anything in general, any niche, like topic or no matter how like specific it is and whether or not this is a good or a bad thing in terms of like targeted ads and maximizing like capital gains off the individual it's definitely a fucking bad thing and I don't like it but social media will you know, shoot you a ton of content about whatever you're interested in which makes it so easy to digest information I mean we're so spoiled back in the day I mean I'm talking like 90s 2000s people are getting all their information from lifting either from just the uh, the gearheads running around the gym or from muscle magazines you know or like uh, like bodybuilding tapes and like CDs and stuff and even in those people weren't really doing their real workouts because they were kind of doing it for the camera you know it's like it wasn't really real whereas now I mean we're at a point where there's a fucking there's so much fitness content that you couldn't even get through it all you know so you have such it's just this vast source of information and if you like the gym Honestly, if you have your fucking phone in your hand and you get in a conversation about lifting weights with your buddy, your, the fucking microphone's going to pick it up and it's going to show you gym videos later on. And that's the part that kind of freaks me out. I mean, you're never going to catch me with an Alexa in my house. I know having a fucking phone on you at all times is the same shit, but whatever. Uh, but it is cool because you sort of passively absorb information about the topic just from scrolling through fucking TikTok and Instagram. So as kind of, you know, cringy and fucking just negative as the fitness social media side is, there is an astronomically higher amount of quality information. But there's also a fucking huge amount of shit, stupid information. So that's where the responsibility lies on you as the viewer to be able to think with your mind, use a little bit of your IQ and say, okay, like let's say you watched a video that was very good, it had a lot of logical sense, you could digest it and make sense to you, that's cool. They're talking about working out or fucking cardio or calories or macros or bicep curls, it could be anything. You watch a video, it makes logical sense in your head and you think, okay, I want to try that out see if it works that's the real proof you know like when you watch a video talking about something everybody's gonna be a bit different in terms of how they respond to you know everything when it comes to training so you can watch as many videos as you want but you do have to try it out for yourself and see how it works but like I was saying a second ago you should be able to see things and after a period of time of lifting talking to people in person, seeing, you know, just sort of scanning the area, reading comments, everything else, you should be able to get a little bit of an idea of when you see something that's fucking stupid and something that's smart. And the people that read into things that are stupid and they take that as fact are the people who just don't fucking get it. You, know, you gotta remember, being big and lean and impressive looking and having a lot of size you know, I know this sounds weird coming from me because usually I'd say like, oh, listen to the big guys. But that doesn't mean that they know the fucking best way to do it or they're going to have good advice for you. you know, some people are just genetically fucking gifted in some specific muscles or just their whole fucking body. You know, 
wear. They're just getting jacked off of like a basic training routine without too much thought. You know, if somebody has just crazy chest genetics and they hit chest like once a week with just a few sets of bench, sure, he looks super impressive. So when he says something about chest training, your initial instinct is like, holy crap, this guy's got a big chest. He's probably fucking smart. Not always, man, you know? So that's that's where it lies on you to say, okay, just because this guy's big doesn't mean he's fucking stupid, you know? And I want you to apply that with me, too. Right? Of course, everyone's going to have an underlying bias when they talk about training. Uh, because if something works, or if you tried something for a few years and you've gotten results from it, then in your mind, you are going to have this sort of thought process like, okay, this works, it works for me, this is the right way to do it, everything else probably isn't as good. And I think I'm subject to that too. I try not to be, like I try to be reasonably unbiased a little, but you can't be completely. So you've got to just realize this guy might be jacked, but eh, he's, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Or this guy's a bit smaller, but he's got some fucking good ass information. That's just on you to figure out. So, if I say some shit that's pretty stupid, you gotta rip on me for it. You know? Uh, don't get the wrong idea. But if I say something smart, give me a... Give me a little... Little comment that says, That was an awesome tip, Sam. I'll read it and I'll go, Yippee! But uh, you get the gist. So... Don't, uh... Don't put too much weight in what people are saying on fucking Instagram and TikTok and YouTube videos. It's good information, but it's not like it's a fucking, you know, peer-reviewed textbook like you get in school where like, okay, this information is highly accurate and it's been, you know, decipher or it's been like read over by PhD ever anybody could just post anything, you know. So trying stuff out for yourself doing a training routine for a few months, trying a specific kind of diet, you know, doing that on a consistent basis, and I cannot stress consistent enough, if you do something like that on a consistent basis for months on end, I'd say if you're bouncing around different workout splits, fuck man, I don't think you should change your workout split that often, because it's not that important. Uh, but training consistently is so keeping the same split I think don't change your split up shorter than every eight weeks I think that's just kind of a general rule which sounds about right because if you're constantly changing your workout like order and everything else you're kind of losing focus on what you should be doing I think but then again do whatever you want I'm just a fucking guy talking uh, but, whatever. but yeah so do some shit and if you make sure you train hard and you really push in the gym, you hit your protein goals, you go to sleep on time, you're eating a good amount of carbs and fats and everything else, you should see results. And if everything else is on point and you're doing a specific kind of training and you're really just kind of plateaued, then that's your cue to say, I got to change something up. So you should almost be like a self-adjusting uh, heat seeking missile. You know, if you know how something like that works, it's got a target, which your target is going to be gains, right? And you start off in this direction. Let's say gains is, uh, it's right here above me. You start off in this direction, you see the results you got, and you think, okay, I should probably change a little bit. And you like, you, you adjust something. Maybe you adjust your training frequency, or you lower your workout volume, or you add cardio. Or maybe, you, uh, maybe you're bulking too hard and you got to lower your calories. Maybe eat a little bit less you know, treats if you're putting body fat on too fast. So you started off on this trajectory, and then now you're here. And you're a little bit closer to that end result, gains. So constantly, over time, you should be making adjustments to your training according to you know, trying to improve it and improve the results that you're getting. And if you can do that, after a few adjustments you should be pretty fucking close, you know? Like, this isn't, um... As, like, I mean, I could sit here for hours talking about every aspect of training 
I mean, I've, I've fucking done it for like the last year and a half. But that's, like I was saying, sometimes I kind of contradict myself. Even though there's that much shit to talk about, it's not rocket science, you know? Like, when I, uh, a lot of the stuff I'm saying, except for a few key things, which I think are potentially groundbreaking for some people's routines, cardio, tracking your macros, training really hard, Honestly, these are three things which I will say with my complete heart and soul. Right. But other than that, all sorts of little tips about like like rep schemes and stuff like that, that's just real minute details. You know, if you can get a good idea of the big picture and make small adjustments over time based on your own results, which you see for yourself, you're golden. You're fucking golden, you know. Like you don't have to write yourself a three-page thesis talking about how you're going to adjust your Arnold split to a push-pull leg split. You know, just fucking do it and see what happens. You, um... So I know how that's kind of a back and forth between, like, keep it simple and try to optimize it. But fuck, man, there's a lot of things in life which are two sides of the same coin. Just do an even mix of both. Same thing with your sets in your workout. For every crazy heavy set, Maybe do a lighter squeezing set. Yeah, it's just fucking... It's always a back and forth. So, take with that what you will. You know, if you're uh, if you're kind of a beginner, you don't know what to do, fucking watch some Jeff Nippard beginner workout split videos. Super concise. Or anybody. You know, it's going to help you to watch people that you like listening to also. So, don't... Uh, just don't get too daunted by the fact that, like, maybe you don't know everything about every aspect of training. Half these guys who are fucking huge on social media don't. You know, it doesn't... Just lift hard. Lift hard, track your macros, and do your cardio. It's... You gotta remember. If, well, maybe not remember, but... If you're bulking up hard, and you're really eating a ton of food, your bulked up weight is the weight that you are in the morning after you go to the bathroom, when you're full of fucking carbs, as full as you can be. So if you have a day where you miss meals, for one thing, not only are you not going to be the surplus for that day, which total opposite goal of, you know, the point of the fucking bulk, but you're going to wake up. I mean, depending on how big you are, you could wake up five pounds light if you have a, you know, a low calorie day on your bulk. Like if tomorrow. I woke up at 257, and then I only ate 2,000 calories. The next day, I'm sure I'd wake up at like fucking 250, maybe 254, maybe even 253 if I was a little bit dehydrated. So that's my main concern when it comes to bulking, is to constantly wake up at about the same weight. Of course, there's going to be different fluctuation. Some days you're just going to be heavier than others. You know, there, if you look at it day by day, it is kind of a fucking wavy back and forth like that. But as long as every day I know that I'm fully carved up, I hit my calories the night before, and I'm weighing pretty similarly, then week to week, I'm getting heavier. When you back up and you zoom out a little bit on the graph, you see a pretty solid trend. And if that trend starts to slow down, and I notice I've been the same weight for like two weeks, that's my cue to get some more calories. Because the primary vector of my growth right now is food. If I was only eating 3,000 calories, I would not be gaining much muscle. Now, 3,000 is about maintenance, maybe a little bit above, maybe. Actually, honestly, my maintenance calories is probably closer to like 3,500 right now. But if I were to eat just a little bit above maintenance, sure, I'd, I mean, I'd still grow muscle for sure. But... The whole point is I want to stay in that really fucking full state. Have an excess, an exorbitant amount of carbs floating around in my system. So, well, not only am I going to have enough energy to actually grow, but being fucking full of food and carved up and strong, I have better lifts. When I diet down, I still have good lifts, of course. I still get nice and pumped and, you know, everything else. But when I'm full of fucking carbs, super strong, do some real heavy-ass weights... That's a good lift.
that's the lift we have today. Fucking a lot of heavy sets, serious amount of damage done. Uh, after I finished arms, I actually did some forearm work at the end. Uh, I did some, I just sat down on a seated cable rail with a D handle and just did some uh, forearm curls like that. I didn't hit the back, but I just did this kind of bottom part. I'm going to throw those in every so often just because I do want bigger forearms. They do make you look pretty fucking cool. Deer just fucking scurried across the road. Yeah, you can't see him through the window. But no plan on stopping. This bulk will continue for, I mean, I can guarantee two months. I can probably even guarantee three months. But that's not really the point. Like, I don't have a specific time or specific weight goal in mind that I want to hit. Really, I'm just trying to gain as much mass as I can. And then once I'm really tapped out, I just can't eat any more food. It's like it's plateaued for about a month or so. And my efforts to eat even more food are just not going to happen. You got to remember, there is a limit. Like, I know it's kind of, or I love saying, if you're not gaining weight, just eat more food. But if you've done a proper bulk for months on end, at least three, maybe even getting up into four, and you seriously just can't break past you know, 4,000 calories, like you just meal prepping, big breakfast, everything evenly distributed throughout the day, I mean, you're going to get to a point where it's just too much. Now, I don't want to do that, of course. That's what I'm fighting against, right? I'm trying to keep the food coming. But once I really hit that plateaued state, that's my cue to say, all right, we got to chill. Oh, can you see him? There's a little street cat running around. Uh, but yeah, don't worry, mass upon mass. I mean, I guess you might not, I mean, <laughs> I can guarantee you don't care as much as I care, but more mass is gonna get fucking slapped onto me. And then this will be a pretty freaky ass diet. So of course, when you're bulking up, you're still in a bulking diet, but when I say diet, usually that means dieting down, right? Cutting, fat loss phase. I'm excited for that too. As much as I love bulking up, being super strong, full of carbs, huge ass fucking pumps, it is fun to kind of think about what I'm gonna look like diced. But don't get ahead of yourself. You gotta remember, if you're, you know, if that's your end goal, if you've got a look in mind, and you know it's a lean grainy whatever weight you gotta remember you can't just go directly from where you are to that it's kind of a roundabout process i guess if you main gain and you got that heavy and you stayed lean the whole time perfect if that works then that works badass uh, but my approach as of late or as of the last few years has been bulk up hard die it down quick like, I'm not dining down for more than usually two or... Yeah, pretty much about two months is about as long as I take. Because I jump straight to a pretty low deficit. Like, as soon as I die down, I'm going to jump straight from 5,500 to, like, 3,000. Uh, and then maybe a little lower than that. And, you know, two months of a reasonably steep deficit, you should see some legit fat loss. You know, And uh, it kind of sucks to say, because it's, it's very... When most people say this, they're kind of saying it in a mean, condescending way. But really, if you can't lose body fat, if you're having trouble losing body fat, and you're like, you're trying all sorts of diets and like intermittent fasting, and I gotta tell you, man, there's only one problem. And that problem is you're eating too many fucking calories. And there's no other, there's, there's no trick. You're not, you don't need to do high intensity workouts or anything special obviously you should be doing your cardio which I know you're not doing but really the only thing stopping anybody from losing body fat is fucking the fact that they're not in an actual deficit and it kind of sucks because you could think you're in a deficit and you could actually be eating you know low enough calories where you are hungry like you do feel hungry but if you're not actually losing body fat then fuck your body is clearly running off of the food that you're feeding it and not having to, you know, burn off its own fat deposits for energy. So it's as simple as that, man. If you got an electric car, it has to run out of gas before it starts using the battery. If you kind of get what I'm saying there. Because you know, 
Your body is going to use its most readily available fuel as its immediate source. So, of course, I'm bulking up right now. For the most part, most of the energy and shit that's being broken down for energy in my body is carbs. Carbs, carbs can get converted into whatever the hell they get converted to in a second. Just like that. Whereas body fat, fuck man, it's going to take a while, right? It's like a kid with some fruit snacks and some broccoli. He's going to hit the fruit snacks first. Right? So if you take away those fucking fruit snacks, if you take away that excess of carbs from your diet, then shit, man, your body's going to have to run off of something. So it's going to start some lipolysis. And assuming that you do it well and you're actually in a consistent calorie deficit, you track your macros, you know, every day you make sure you're at your 2300 calorie goal, then guess what? After two months, you're going to fucking notice. Right? And uh, not to knock on any other style of dieting, like people doing keto and Atkins and like uh, a variety of cookbooks, but the people who I see make the most noticeable and fucking drastic changes, and uh, I guess more of like a body fat transformation style, it's the ones who get it. It's the ones who understand, yeah, shit, I'm eating too many fucking calories. I gotta back off. And then it's not just like that. They also eat specific foods. You know, when I diet down, I'm not gonna be drinking fucking chocolate milk. I'm not gonna be fucking getting McDonald's. Right? Those are calorie-dense foods. Those are foods where you know, I can eat 500 calories and not even really feel full at all. So when I diet down, I'm eating way more calorie, well, way more low-calorie-dense foods. Right? High-fiber bread. Right? You go to the bread aisle, keto bread. Make a fucking turkey sandwich with low-fat mayonnaise, a bunch of lettuce, and some, uh, some mustard. You have two of those. Fuck, man. A lot of that is like fluff food. So you're going to feel full, but you won't have so many calories in your fucking stomach. And it'll just be easier to be in a deficit. I, I end up talking about dieting a lot more when I am dieting. So maybe I should maybe I should talk about that a little more. Every time I I get a little bit of a one-track mind where I always, uh, I always end up talking about whatever I'm doing at this current moment and not some other shit that I may not be so inclined to discuss but main idea is train as hard as you can try to do your cardio on a consistent basis look up you know macros for bodybuilding on YouTube there's a fucking bazillion videos <gasps> and then if you do that for a few months on end guess what you are gonna see some progress and if you're not seeing any progress, then something in your equation is off, and that's your responsibility to fix. Right? You know, this is your fucking lifting journey, not anybody else's. So, let's take control of it. You gotta be able to deal with that, you know? So, this is primarily directed towards the beginner lifter, where you're still kind of making this transition into a fucking, I mean pretty serious commitment if you are locked into making some you know, serious gains and what I mean by that is there are I don't want to say haters I think the word I mean I mean this in the opposite way of enablers but there are disablers which you're gonna run into into your uh, transition to getting into fitness right there are gonna be dudes where if you bring a fucking you know Tupperware bodybuilder style into your school lunch I guess this I'm kind of maybe directing this at like high school because I feel like the majority of people who start lifting are probably in high school at least the people watching this but this could apply to anybody let's say you bring it to work too you know I'll hear stories about my mom where like she used to work in a like an office with this one bodybuilder dude and he'd always whip out some fucking canned tuna and everybody back to you that fucking stinks in a case like that maybe just switch to chicken or something that doesn't smell so bad be a little more courteous but like i was saying you know, kind of high school lunchroom 
mean, fuck, man, I was busting out boiled eggs when I was dieting down. Because even though I was kind of main gaining in high school, I would still sort of... You know, I would cut every so often. I would get lean every so often, then go back to main gaining, or lean bulking, as it were. But there were definitely times where, you know, I've got my sort of high school friend group where it's like me and everybody else, my brother too. So they'd show up at the house sometimes, pick my brother up and you know, go off to do whatever shenanigans. And I'm like, fuck man, I'm staying home, I gotta eat. Or, you know, I, I don't want to stay up too late because I gotta wake up early to do my cardio. Um, I'm a little bit lazy with my sleep schedule now because with college classes, you don't really have to wake up at a perfect time every day. I probably should work on that. But, you know, there's definitely times where you gotta kinda say no because you're doing something for you because you want to do it and it's going to get you results. Right? So, fuck. Everybody in my house looked at me like I was crazy when I was drinking egg whites and you know, eating sardines in the fucking kitchen. Uh, they probably thought I was especially crazy because that was when I was only a 160 pound beginner. So I'm doing all this crazy stuff food wise, like gym wise, and I didn't even have the results yet to back it up. You know, If you saw me chug a, you know, a mason jar full of egg whites, eat some sardines, and, uh, you know, drink a gallon of crystal light now as a 260 pound dude, even in fucking public, you know, even if somebody didn't know, like, who I was, and they just saw a big dude eating very strangely, they're just going to recognize the fact that that is to do with you know, the results that I've got. So you almost get a pass. You know, it's like the bigger you are, the more of a pass you get for doing you know, kind of classic lifter shit, right? You're not a poser. So as a beginner, you, know, you might hear people say like, oh, why the fuck are you eating that, dude? Come on, that's fucking stupid. Uh, or, you know, if, if, you're, uh, if you have potentially less than desirable friends and you, you, know, you want to say no to uh, like a hangout or like a trip or whatever else because, you know, you want to lift then fuck man, they might rip on you. They might rip on you a little bit. And that's where you gotta say, eh, fuck off man, I'm getting huge. Hit it anyway. You know? So, the more of a uh, shield you can put up on your fucking brain and just, you know, deflect any potentially demotivating comments or fucking opinions, especially as a beginner, the better. Right, honestly, as a beginner, that's the most important fucking part. You know, nobody is ever going to give me flack for eating a weird-ass fucking bodybuilding meal and carrying around a gallon jug of water. Because, fuck, man, when you're big, people get the gist. But, you know, as a beginner, if somebody's like, oh, why are you, why are you drinking so much water? Or just, this is, I'm kind of just saying hypotheticals, too. This isn't necessarily, like, things that I've really heard that much. But... If you can get the mindset of just saying, eh, fuck off, and really meaning it when people say some shit that's fucking just like, ugh, I mean, just straight up negative. Anything negative. You know, if you can not let that get under your skin and just keep going how you're going, you're going to set yourself up for success. You know, the chump lifter, or really the chump in general, in any aspect of life, who can hear you know, negative shit or like just fucking let people get under their skin and piss them off and like you know like if somebody t was mean to them early in the day and they have a completely bad day because of it because you like you care about what somebody thinks and look not cool right not freaking cool now the interstitial state between chump and baller is somebody who you know, they, they maybe get a little bit upset, but they don't let it bother them too much. You know, it's like, oh, they're being mean. <laughs> Screw them. Um, go about your business. Whereas the enlightened, I, I'd say the enlightened lifter, but I really just mean the enlightened person. Whenever he hears some shit that may be potentially targeted at him, <laughs> if he just doesn't even, doesn't even react, not even mentally, like, just nothing and then here's something cool and motivating he goes oh shit I like that that's what he kind of puts his energy into he's gonna have a better time and of course this goes for everything but I'm gonna relate it to lifting you know, 
And, uh, I mean, fuck, man, let's be real. If you post a video of yourself posing, it doesn't matter how big or small you are, you're gonna get comments like, oh, what the fuck, just fucking random ass hate comments, whatever. It's part of the deal. Right? We've all seen, uh, we've all seen David Goggins, right? We all get the gist there. But, one, uh, one key aspect, one key, like, shift in your mentality and your thought process, which will definitely get you going, is to be able to convert anything negative into a fucking positive. Right? And I don't mean that in like a uh, in like a hope pilled, like like be nice kind of way. Right? I mean that like if somebody's fucking with you or something, or somebody's making you mad, or it's I can't really think of an exact scenario right now. I've said this speech before, and I've had actual examples. I can't really remember them, but you know, fuck. Anything that you can take in your mind, which could maybe potentially demotivate you, right? flip it around and turn it into something cool, right? Somebody, I don't know. Somebody makes fun of you for being weak on a certain lift. Don't say this is the situation you should not have in your head. Oh man, he's right. I'm, my bench is weak. And cry to yourself. Not cool. Now, you flip that around, you say, uh, just wait, you mother effer. Just wait till I double my bench in the next few years. Just wait. You know what I'm saying? I can't really... Fuck, I don't know. I've said this, I, I've said this exact speech before, like, many months ago. Or maybe even like a year ago or so. And I had a lot more actual examples. I don't know, man. You guys fucking spoil me. All the comments are like, good lift, man. We love seeing it. Um, I feel a little... And like, I love it. That's fucking sweet. But honestly, part of me kind of misses getting more hate comments. Because it kind of fires me up. You know? As as cra as you know, stupid as that sounds. Yeah. So, Whenever you see me do a set that's maybe a little bit too easy... Or you can tell I left some shit in the tank. I need you to fucking comment below. Say some shit like, uh, that was a fucking pussy set of leg press. You didn't even throw up. Like, honestly, hearing that kind of shit kind of fires me up, you know. Like, the more you can kind of get excited and motivated by even negative shit like that, okay, and you set yourself up for success. So I think that's the end of my little shtick there. Whether you get it or not, whatever. But solid leg day, that pendulum leg press was fucking cool. That was really fucking cool. I need to do that more often. I liked that one. You know what? I, I think I should have done that single leg. I think if I would have done that set single leg, I probably would have had a better time. Because I noticed this on leg extensions and some leg pressing movements. Is if I do both legs at once, I mean... Both your quads firing at the same time, that is just sucking oxygen out of your lungs. And I feel like it makes me out of breath a little bit faster. Whereas if I were to do one leg at a time, it wouldn't be so taxing on my whole system because the set is spread out over a longer period. You know, because I'm doing one side, breathing for a few seconds, and then doing the other side, rather than both at once. And also I think it might help me focus on each quad individually a little bit more. But maybe I'm just saying that because the sets were hard and I was out of breath. But yeah, I, I really like that one. And even though it was a leg press, I wasn't really getting too much glutes activation. Which that's freaking sweet. Like I was saying on the way here, if, uh, if a leg press really fires my glutes to the point where I feel it more there in my butt than I do in my quads, then that's a little bit of an indicator. Uh, indicator little bit of an indicator to me to say I don't like it I don't much like that I'm gonna do some Smith machine squats or barbell squats or leg extensions but that one was pretty cool that one was pretty cool I feel kinda of bad I've always had such a closed mind about that machine I've never used it before now and I've been going to this gym for years but not good the last thing you want to do is limit yourself in terms of your fucking exercise selection just for the insignificant thought process of like, oh, that machine doesn't look that good. I'm not going to use it. Stupid. Stupid, stupid, stupid. I feel bad for being uh, 
for having such a narrow mind. As a lifter, it will always do you good to widen your horizons. You know, like I was saying to the pose down, like listening to people talk about training. And this is one thing that's kind of cool about, well, I was going to say about lifting, but it's really cool for anything in general, any niche, like topic or no matter how like specific it is and whether or not this is a good or a bad thing in terms of like targeted ads and maximizing like capital gains off the individual it's definitely a fucking bad thing and I don't like it but social media will you know, shoot you a ton of content about whatever you're interested in which makes it so easy to digest information I mean, we're so spoiled. Back in the day, I mean, I'm talking like 90s, 2000s, people are getting all their information from lifting either from just the uh, the gearheads running around the gym or from muscle magazines, you know, or like, uh, like bodybuilding tapes and like CDs and stuff. And even in those, people weren't really doing their real workouts because they were kind of doing it for the camera, you know. It's like it wasn't really real. Whereas now, I mean, we're at a point where there's a fucking... There's so much fitness content that you couldn't even get through it all, you know? So you have such, it's just this vast source of information. And if you like the gym, honestly, if you have your fucking phone in your hand and you get in a conversation about lifting weights with your buddy, the fucking microphone's going to pick it up and it's going to show you gym videos later on. That's the part that kind of freaks me out. I mean, you're never going to catch me with an Alexa in my house. I know having a fucking phone on you at all times is the same shit, but whatever. Uh, but it is cool because you sort of passively you know, absorb information about the topic just from scrolling through fucking TikTok and Instagram. You know? So as kind of you know cringy and fucking just negative as the fitness social media side is, there is an astronomically higher amount of quality information but there's also a fucking huge amount of shit stupid information so that's where the responsibility lies on you as the viewer to be able to think with your mind use a little bit of your IQ and say okay like let's say you watched a video that was very good it had a lot of logical sense you could digest it and make sense to you that's cool they're talking about working out or cardio or calories or macros or bicep curls it could be anything you watch a video it makes logical sense in your head and you think okay I want to try that out see if it works that's the real proof you know like when you watch a video talking about something everybody's gonna be a bit different in terms of how they respond to you know everything when it comes to training so you can watch as many videos as you want but you do have to try it out for yourself and see how it works but like I was saying a second ago you should be able to see things and after a period of time of lifting you know, talking to people in person seeing you know, just sort of scanning the area reading comments everything else you should be able to get a little bit of an idea of when you see something that's fucking stupid and something that's smart and the people that read into things that are stupid and they take that as fact are the people who just don't fucking get it. You, know, you gotta remember, being big and lean and impressive looking and having a lot of size, it, you know, I know this sounds weird coming from me because usually I'd say like, oh, listen to the big guys, but that doesn't mean that they know the fucking best way to do it or they're gonna have good advice for you. you know, some people are just genetically fucking gifted in some specific muscles or just their whole fucking body, you know, where they're just getting jacked off of like, a basic training routine without too much thought you know if somebody has just crazy chest genetics and they hit chest like once a week with just a few sets of bench sure he looks super impressive so when he says something about chest training your initial instinct is like holy crap this guy's got a big chest he's probably fucking smart not always man you know so that's that's where it lies on you to say okay just because this guy's big doesn't mean he's fucking stupid and I want you to apply that with me, too. Right? Of course, everyone's going to have an underlying bias when they talk about training. Uh, because if something works, or if you tried something for a few years, 
and you've gotten results from it, then in your mind, you are going to have this sort of thought process like, okay, this works, it works for me, this is the right way to do it, everything else probably isn't as good. And I think I'm subject to that too. I try not to be, like I try to be reasonably unbiased a little, but you can't be completely. So you've got to just realize this guy might be jacked, but eh, he's, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Or this guy's a bit smaller, but he's got some fucking good ass information. Well, that's just on you to figure out. So if I say some shit that's pretty stupid, you got to rip on me for it, you know? Uh, don't get the wrong idea. But if I say something smart, give me a give me a little little comment that says that was an awesome tip, Sam. I'll read it and I'll go yippee. But uh, you get the gist. So don't uh don't put too much weight in what people are saying on fucking Instagram and TikTok and YouTube videos. It's good information, but it's not like it's a fucking you know peer reviewed textbook like you get in school where like okay this information is highly accurate and it's been you know decipher or it's been like read over by phd ever anybody could just post anything you know so trying stuff out for yourself right? doing a training routine for a few months trying a specific kind of diet you know, doing that on a consistent basis and i cannot stress consistent enough if you do something like that on a consistent basis for months on end, I'd say if you're bouncing around different workout splits, fuck man, I don't think you should change your workout split that often because it's not that important. Uh, but training consistently is. So keeping the same split, I think. Don't change your split up shorter than every eight weeks. I think that's just kind of a general rule, which sounds about right. Because if you're constantly changing your workout like order and everything else, you're kind of losing focus on what you should be doing, I think. But then again, do whatever you want. I'm just a fucking guy talking. Uh, but, whatever. but yeah, so do some shit. And if you make sure you train hard and you really push in the gym, you hit your protein goals, you go to sleep on time, you're eating a good amount of carbs and fats and everything else, you should see results. And if everything else is on point and you're doing a specific kind of training and you're really just kind of plateaued, then that's your cue to say, I got to change something up. You know? So you should almost be like a self adjusting, you know, uh, heat seeking missile. You know, if you know how something like that works, it's got a target, which your target is going to be gains, right? And you start off in this direction. Let's say gains is uh, it's right here above me. You start off in this direction, you see the results you got, and you think, okay, I should probably change a little bit, and you like you, you adjust something. Maybe you adjust your training frequency, or you lower your workout volume, or you add cardio, or maybe, you, uh, maybe you're bulking too hard and you gotta lower your calories. Maybe eat a little bit less you know, treats if you're putting body fat on too fast. So you started off on this trajectory, and then now you're here and you're a little bit closer to that end result, the gains. So constantly over time, you should be making adjustments to your training according to you know, trying to improve it and improve the results that you're getting. And if you can do that, after a few adjustments, you should be pretty fucking close, you know? Like this isn't um, as, like, I mean, I could sit here for hours talking about every aspect of training. I mean, I've, I've fucking done it for like the last year and a half, but that's like I was saying sometimes I kind of contradict myself even though there's that much shit to talk about it's not rocket science you know like when I uh, a lot of the stuff I'm saying except for a few key things which I think are potentially groundbreaking for some people's routines cardio tracking your macros training really hard honestly these are three things which I will say with my complete heart and soul. Right. But other than that, all sorts of little tips about like, like rep schemes and stuff like that, that's just real minute details. You know, if you can get a good idea of the big picture, 
and make small adjustments over time based on your own results, which you see for yourself, you're golden. You're fucking golden, you know. Like, you don't have to write yourself a three-page thesis talking about how you're going to adjust your Arnold split to a push-pull leg split. You know, just fucking do it and see what happens. You, um... So I know how that's kind of a back and forth between, like, keep it simple and try to optimize it. But fuck, man, there's a lot of things in life which are two sides of the same coin. Just do an even mix of both. Same thing with your sets in your workout. For every crazy heavy set, maybe do a lighter squeezing set. Yeah, it's just fucking, it's always a back and forth. So, take with that what you will. You know, if you're, uh, if you're kind of a beginner, you don't know what to do, fucking watch some Jeff Nippard beginner workout split videos. Super concise. Or anybody. It's going to help you to watch people that you like listening to also. So, don't, uh, just don't get too daunted by the fact that, like, maybe you don't know everything about every aspect of training. Half these guys who are fucking huge on social media don't. You know, it doesn't. Just lift hard. And, uh, this is something I think about. For the most part, I don't love the idea of, like, doing a quad bias leg day. And then doing like a hamstring bias leg day. Because in my mind, it's like I want to give every muscle equal attention. But I can say for sure, I have a much easier time with hamstrings because I'm hitting hamstrings first. And I'm not pre exhausted with anything. You know, I can just jump straight into it. So by the time I get to quads, even though my quads aren't tired out specifically, I have just done like six or seven pretty hard sets. And your hamstrings, even though definitely secondary to your quads they're still a pretty fucking big muscle and they definitely take some energy out of me to the point where it makes me think that my quad workout is a little bit uh, let's just say compromised by the fact that I'm a little tired out from hamstrings and for me you gotta remember this as well when you're bulked up uh, just from my fat distribution compared to everything else my legs don't get any extra, like, width. Because, like, when, I'm, when I bulk up, I've got a good amount of fat in, like, my uh, like sides, lower back. It's pretty evenly distributed for me, but I get a lot of sides and lower back. So if you're looking at me from the front, my waist is a little bit wider. So when I'm bulked up, just by, you know, angles and whatever, my legs do look a bit smaller. So when I cut down, you know, proportionally, they kind of maintain their size while everything else falls into place. But I think my quads need more work than my hamstrings. Even though my hamstrings aren't like jumping out at you like crazy, they're pretty fucking developed. And I'd say, I mean, every muscle is gonna look crazier when you cut down, but hamstrings especially, they sort of like blow up when you, you know, die it down and you peel off some of that extra body fat you got on you because you have a lot of fucking body fat on your, um, well, maybe not you, but for me, I've got a good chunk on my butt too. So when you're looking at me from the side, if I'm doing like a side chest and I'm trying to like pop my hamstring out, you know, my butt is just extra big because it's got some fat on. You know, when I cut down, it shrinks a few sizes and my hamstrings just look even bigger. You know, when people do, uh, like when you see actual bodybuilders and they're doing a side chest or whatever, and they're really fucking lean. Their hamstrings look fucking huge. Also, they're kind of smushing the hamstrings up against their other leg, but that's its own thing. And uh, my camera's battery is near dead, so if this cuts out in the middle of something, fuck. So tomorrow's gonna be a chest day, so I'll be there for that. I'm just kind of prepping if this thing fucking dies mid-recording. Uh, but yeah, so. I think I might want to chill out on hamstrings a little bit, just so I can give my quads more attention. I'm still going to hit hamstrings hard, of course, but I think it might be in my best interest, for my build at least, to really thrash quads and then maybe save hamstrings for later. I don't usually love that approach, because for me, hamstrings first, quads just feel better. Like after I get a hamstring pump, heavy pressing feels better, squats and leg press. 
honestly, leg extensions feel kind of good. I've just got more blood in the area of like the back of my knee, a little bit of ex extra, you know, cushion in that whole fucking, you know, knee joint. So hamstrings first does make my quad days feel better. But I think I might just have to do a bit of hamstrings, then do quads, and maybe come back to hamstrings at the end just to finish off some more, you know, some more of its workload. So that when I do quads, I'm not already out of breath. I like doing all the hamstrings first, so when I actually start doing quads, I can give them my full attention and I don't have to have like my subconscious telling me, okay, you still have hamstrings later, save a little bit of energy for yourself. Like finishing with quads, it kind of lets me try to go all out, at least as much as I can, knowing that, you know, my last set of leg extensions and super, like super set it with sissy squats or whatever I end up doing is the last set of the lift and I can really push it. But yeah, I think for me, quads need a bit more attention, so I may kind of fluctuate my uh, my distribution of workload, or maybe just my exercise order, and do more quad stuff first and finish with hamstrings. So that's kind of something you're gonna have to figure out for yourself. You know, it's just fucking whatever. But good lift, good pump. I'm ready to fill back up with carbs and get this bulk back on track. So totally different anecdote what gets you fucking hyped up what gets you going is it when uh is it when everybody's cheering for you and you got a whole crew of uh of your buddies watching you do your sets and kind of yelling at you like come on like uh like when larry wheels is doing curls with the chain around his neck and, and uh you know, he's got his fucking hype man screaming at him or you know, are you more kind of a stoic sort of samurai style lifter you want to totally quiet just get your shit done yourself. The um, whatever floats your boat. But I think the guys who are really on it, and the dudes who can really you know, make satisfactory gains over a long term. Uh, for one thing, it's not the guy. Okay, I actually had a second battery. Saved it. Um, so yeah, the guys who can really fucking push it, long term, legit gains. You know, like. Dudes, you ask them how long they've been lifting, they're, they're going to tell you, like, fucking, oh, I've been doing this for 12 years. Like, dudes like that. I was about to say, it's not the guys with the best genetics or who can do the hardest sets. It's the guys who can just maintain a fucking steady mind, you know, stay in one track and just ride it smoothly. And dudes like that, or girls too, not disparaging, and it's, it's the people who can kind of, you know, have an iron mind. It's the guys who don't let anything really fuck with them. It's, it's not like I'm saying, like, don't, like, oh, don't feel emotion. Don't be deterred by any kind of negative things around you. But if you're so easily susceptible to, like, just negativity that it really just fucks up your day. Or, like, if, um, uh, if somebody said something mean to you or, like, you're getting in beef with your, with your buddies or whoever else or, like, I mean, just something about your life is kind of fucking rubbing you the wrong way. If you're so easily deterred from your, you know, from your routine, that that sort of stuff, you just really let it seep into you. You're constantly thinking about it. It's fucking messing up your mindset. You're, uh, you can't get good lifts. You don't even want to go to the gym because, like, for whatever reason, no matter, like, something's going on, it makes you just feel like shit. <sighs> I don't want to say, like, oh, you got to suck it up because that's, I mean, that's just a mean thing to say. But to an extent, you kind of you kind of do, you know. Like if you can understand, like some people are just fucking mean or whatever. Then, if you actually can kind of comprehend that in your mind, then what? Are you surprised? Like, are you surprised that there's like assholes in the world? Like whatever. You, know, you just kind of accept it. You kind of uh, have to accept things how they are, and don't let them like seep into your own system, right? You got a fucking temple. That's you. That's your mind, that's your subconscious, that's everything. And the more chill you can be in there, right, and the less you can let anything seep into you, or like, a, you know, let's say you're real fucking ambitious. Early on lifter, you're talking about like, oh, you know, one day I want to be, I want to be on stage with fucking Chris Bumstead, you know, or I want to I wanna be able to do a post down next to so-and-so and really be able to hold my own. Uh, or it could be whatever, if I'm talking, like, I say this every time. A lot of this kind of motivational or whatever, like, 
you know, one track mindedness sort of uh, like tips or whatever I'm saying. I mean it to apply to everything, like no matter what you're doing. But of course, if I'm talking about something, I'm going to loop it back around to weightlifting, and, you know, muscle growth and bodybuilding. But if that's your shit, you know, you get a real fucking big ass ambition and like even thinking about it just gets you excited. Let's say you tell somebody and they're like, oh, that's fucking stupid. You're never going to be able to do that. Or, um, oh, sometimes I think about this before. I remember early on, I was like, uh, I was telling somebody, I'm like going on about like lifting or something. Or I was like saying, oh, I got to go to the gym. And somebody was like, oh, come on. You're not a real bodybuilder. And at the time I was like, you know, 180 pound lifter. Right. But that sort of stuff. Sometimes I do think about that and it kind of gets me riled up. Uh, but that's, that's a point that I'm going to talk about in a second. But like, remember, man, there's a lot of fucking negativity out in the world. And if, you, uh, if you're surprised by that, if you, and you can kind of let that stuff into you, you're setting yourself up for fucking failure. You know, like I was about to say, you've got your temple in your mind, right? That's where you should be nice and zen, very smooth, very go with the flow in a sense. You know, be able to do your shit without um, being deterred by whatever's going on around you. And the more that you can let just shit in, like thinking about trying to impress people or like trying to please somebody or do something because somebody says so or you want to, you know, you want to fit someone else's like mold of what's good or bad. Fuck, man, come on. You know? You're the captain of your own ship. And if you can steer it to wherever you truly want to go in your own fucking mind rather than where other people are trying to like you know, force you into or whatever and you can really live your own life how you want to do it you're gonna have so much more fucking fun and not even fun but just it's more chill you know uh this is getting into a little bit more so just talk about like day-to-day -day life but how much time do you spend like worrying or contemplating or like listening and gossiping it's just shit that doesn't even really fucking matter People can toil away for years upon years about shit which, like, for them, in their mind, they consider, like, extremely important. But really, it's just fucking stupid bullshit, you know? Like, I see this a lot just looking out in the world. And I see people getting real fucking upset about anything. You know, insert anything that people are getting upset about. And, you know, more than <laughs> nine times out of ten, or probably more than that, I don't think, oh my god, they hey, they have a noble cause that they're getting riled up about. Good for them. <laughs> Nine times out of ten, I see people freaking out about some random shit, and I'm like, wow, you really just have nothing better to do, you know? So the more that you kind of focus on just random fucking stupid nothingness, it's going to reflect in, you know, how you are as a person. So for the most part... I just couldn't be fucked, you know, with all sorts of randomness out and everywhere, arguments, fucking you know, people, debates, uh, gives a shit, man. Right? Wake up, have a nice breakfast, do your shit, watch some TV shows, whatever, have a badass lift, eat some more food and go to bed. That's awesome. Why well, do I want to deal with any other stupid whatever? Uh, fuck, what was I about to say? There's more, there's more to this. I just need a moment. I think that was about it. So main idea, honestly, you just kind of have to, the more you can kind of really internally exemplify the lifestyle of like, you know, I don't care. Like I care about my stuff. I care about the people around me, what I care about. And everything else is just kind of noise in the background. The more you can do that, the better. Because you've only got so much, well, for one thing, we've only got so much time in the day. But on a more maybe kind of, uh, not spiritual, but kind of like mental capacity, you've only, got, you've only got so much energy, man. Like you've only got so much, so many things that you can focus on. So if you're in like fucking group chats and you're constantly, like I think this is just an absolute leech on your fucking mental, uh, mental energy. Just like, oh, did you hear what she said about him? Oh, my, what did he do? Oh, my. This is your fucking energy bar right here. 
down to zilch. Ugh, come on. Stupid. It's, uh, that's some, like, elementary playground shit. Right? So, in that sense, I think you've only got a few things you can really lock in and you know, put your mind into and your, I don't want to say soul behind. I'm not that spiritual. But, like, you know, really get into. And if you can kind of narrow that down to just a few things, then I think those few things you're going to get more out of. And if you're constantly spreading yourself thin, thinking about this and that and whatever, all sorts of just nothingness that doesn't even matter, then it's going to show. It's going to freaking show. So I think that's all I got to say there. And what's crazy is like we know this. Like I know, and I, I'm not. I'm not talking like I'm a fucking perfect example. I waste so much fucking time, like just playing on my phone and just being like stupid. Uh, but you know, we all know when we're doing shit that's dumb. We all know when we're doing something we're like, oh, it's. I definitely am probably wasting my fucking time with this, right? So you kind of have to have a little bit of a, a little bit of a stronger fist when it comes to your mind. Because you've got, uh, I love hearing, I love like watching videos about this, not all the time, but you know, every so often, kind of like stoic sort of philosophy kind of videos. And like, that's not my shit all the time. You know, I'm watching brain rot, like fucking TV shows and TikTok. But in your mind, you've almost got, I mean, we all know this, you've got your conscious and your unconscious mind, your subconscious. So, you know, whenever you're kind of thinking some, like, whenever thoughts kind of pop up in your mind spontaneously, that's your subconscious, right? If you're, if you know you're going to the gym and you've got it scheduled, like, oh, I've got a leg day, whenever subconsciously in your mind the thought arises, like, oh, man, I should probably skip the gym today, just because your subconscious is like, oh, this is going to be difficult, I don't want to do it, it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of effort, I'm very tired. When you have a sort of thought like that, and I know I'm getting on it, I'm just going all sorts of different ways with this talk, but uh, whatever. Uh, but when you're in this kind of, uh, let me get back to it. So when that sort of thought arises, like, oh, I should probably skip legs today. That's when your conscious mind has to listen to that thought and say, what the fuck is that? Get real. Come on. That's fucking stupid. You know, because you can't really control your subconscious thoughts. They're just going to pop up like, like whatever. It's just, it's subconscious, you can't control it. But the part of you that can control what you do, you know, your active fucking mind, you've got to fucking tighten your leash. So even though you may think like, oh crap, I better skip legs today, I'm fucking tired. Man up, say, come on, it's fucking stupid, let's go. And that same thought process, I think if you apply that to everything else in your life, you're going to have a better time. You know, it's like, oh man, I should probably do this or so, and if consciously you know, like, oh, this is a, this is probably a bad fucking move, I probably shouldn't do this, listen to it, freaking listen to it, so I think that's all I got, we're getting on a, going on some random ass tangents, but whatever, honestly, that's where some of the gold lies, these little, uh, these little off the cuff stream of consciousness chit chats, if I do enough of them, I know I'll end up saying something mad, uh, mad motivational and cool. But, little uh, conclusive statement. I'm ready to get back into my normal routine of weights and food. My legs are fucking not burning, but I can tell they just all around feel kind of fucking tender. I haven't hit legs for like a week and a half. Uh, well, I haven't really hit quads for like a week and a half. So I'm fucking sure that I'm going to feel them tomorrow. I should probably do an Epsom salt bath. <laughs> That's one thing that kind of sucks about my school apartment. is um, It's got two bathrooms, you know, me and my roommate. But just showers. I would love to do, like, salt baths on a consistent basis. And then when I die it down, sometimes I like doing ice baths. Maybe not even because I'm like, oh, this is going to have some tangible, you know, physical benefits for me. But whenever I diet down, since I'm not constantly, you know, pushing a ton of food into my system, I almost feel like I want to make my days, like, a little bit more difficult just for its own fucking sake. 
Holy fuck, did you see that guy? Dude, it's going like one fucking ten. Oh. But oh yeah, so ice bats on occasion. Full day of eating. I know I've I know I've kept it from you. I'll get one pretty soon. Same thing with a grocery trip. Um I think I uh <laughs> I think I want to get a smaller camera. Like a little um I don't know if you know anything about photography, but like a little uh like a DJI, like a pocket three or something. Because <laughs> when I put the whole tripod set up with like this big ass fucking Sony lens and everything in the grocery cart and I'm pushing it around the store. It makes me so fucking embarrassed. It's like a whole uh it's like a whole cinematography thing. Just let's just say this, it fucking draws eyes. So if I could set up just a teeny little camera right there on the cart, that would probably be a little bit more inconspicuous. So maybe if I get one of those I'll do them a little more often. I know um I know it's a little bit or not a little bit. I know it's very repetitive when it's just workout after workout after workout. But you gotta remember that's the fucking that's the meat and potatoes. That's what it actually I mean not what it takes, but that's what's actually gonna get you gains, you know. So I mean if you're <laughs> if you're watching these videos because you're waiting for them to do like a like an oiled up challenge or like a, like anything stupid like that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hate to say it, but you're sorely mistaken. Lifts after lifts. A thousand more to come, easily. So, that's all I got. I'll see you tomorrow for chest, which I am... I'm already excited for it. Oh my goodness. I am. The day that I almost trained chest on the weekend, we uh, there was just no time to train. So yeah, on, uh, I think it was Saturday. That was my first rest day for a while. But it definitely didn't feel like a rest day because I was so fucking tired after standing around all day. But back to normal routine. Let's pack some fucking muscle onto my frame. I will see you tomorrow for chest.